from the biggest natural structure on Earth. Wow, it's incredible oh, down there. To the slopes of Europe's most active volcano. There's been an earthquake on the south side of Etna. Hey, la and from the blustery English Channel to Zimbabwe's incredible wildlife. Are we okay with them being that close? <laughs> Welcome to our favorite adventures from the great outdoors. And welcome to Cash, not too far from Antalya on the South Turkish coast. It's beautiful here and a great spot for adventure as well as to get some fresh air. Which is appropriate for today's program because we're revisiting some of our favorite memories of the great outdoors. And what better place to start than one of the biggest and most fragile ecosystems on the entire planet. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is enormous. And you can see it from space. Around 10% of all fish species live here. As a diver, there aren't many places that can beat it. Due to increased water temperatures, there's been several mass bleaching events here in the Great Barrier Reef. 2016 and 2017 especially, couple that with a severe tropical cyclone and up to 80% of the reef was affected. For myself, an ocean lover, it's very worrying. But there are stretches, like here on the southern part, that still thrive. Schools of fish, rays, sharks and turtles are all abundant. I'm here to meet some of the people who've devoted their lives to keeping it that way. So Andy, exactly how big is the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, it's immense. I mean, it's about the same surface area as Germany. 2,300 kilometers in length, thousands of reefs, hundreds of islands. Massive. It sounds massive. It must be hard to survey the entire thing then. Yeah, they, so they reckon that 40% um, of the reef hasn't been surveyed. So from a, from a conservation perspective, so massive, but imagine how the logistics you would require in order to do the whole, the whole reef would be, you know, immense. Andy's the brains behind Earth yeah. Hour. That 60 minutes every year when businesses and landmarks turn off their lights to raise awareness of climate change. Oh Here we are. Now though, are. he's turned his attention to the reef and is convinced education is the key to its survival. So what I'm going to show you now is, is reef tracks. Tracks. which um, is something that we've already launched and is starting to show the, um, the animals that have got satellite tags um, that are out on the reef. Oh, wow, yeah, cool yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a... Um, green turtle? Yeah, green turtle, tiger shark, whale shark. This is about to show you, show you a whale shark. So this is the <laughs> first whale shark that's ever been tagged on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh-huh. And um, it lost its tag after about 4,000 kilometers, but it went all the way up the reef, then out into the Coral Sea, and then up into the Solomon Sea. The idea is to make people all over the world feel more attached to the reef and more fired up about protecting it. But the project he's hoping to launch next is even more ambitious, and aims to give tourists here a proper role in data collection. We call it the Great Reef Census. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to, to try and do a, um, a state of the reef survey in a really short period of time. So you imagine that every tourism boat becomes a research boat for that period of time. And anybody who's like a proficient snorkeler who's out on those boats can become part of this project. So that's kind of in the water piece. But then beyond that, the citizen science, where the citizen science really kicks in is the analysis. So you've got this shot of a piece of reef. It's geotagged so you know where it is then you could be sitting in your uh, bedroom in Amsterdam or you know, your office in uh, London and you can, you can be part of the analysis. It's a really ambitious project, so it's not been done before like this uh, or, or on this scale. 
Save some fun for me! <laughs> Collecting information is one thing, but there's been a significant breakthrough this year that has seen new life brought back to dead and dying reefs. One night a year, the corals simultaneously release millions of eggs and sperm into the waters. It looks like a massive underwater snowstorm. Professor Harrison has set about capturing that spawn and relocating it to areas that need it most. Okay, what's the plan? <laughs> okay, Mike, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to take these calipers okay. and just go down and measure the coral. He measures the new coral regularly and has found that it's been thriving, but he's also found that after three years, it's sexually reproductive, triggering a domino effect of regeneration. Can you tell us a bit about the breakthrough you've made? Yeah, so what we've been doing is some really exciting research. One of the innovations that we've just trialled in the Philippines is using an underwater robot, which we've called Luna, the larval bot. And Luna is helping us deliver literally millions of coral larvae onto really degraded reef systems. And the really exciting news is that we've got to hectare scales, which means we can start to think about large scale restoration using this larval technique on reefs all around the world, including the Great Barrier Reef. This is just part of the solution. We have to restore coral populations, but we also have to manage climate change. Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Since this was filmed, actually, Professor Harrison's work has spread farther north to the Whitsunday Islands, which is great for him, so let's wish him good luck with that. Coming up next this week, we're returning to Europe and to one of nature's most powerful and frightening forces. Volcanoes. This year has been a busy one for the people whose job it is to monitor Mount Etna. The Sicilian volcano has been erupting regularly since mid-February. Back in 2019, we went along to meet some of the people living and working on her slopes. There's been an earthquake on the south side of Etna. Eh, la sirena, ecco. In one of the most volcanic regions in Europe, an earthquake is detected. It could indicate devastating activity on the continent's largest volcano. But still, on Etna, tourists gather unaware. Right now we are by 9,000 feet above the sea level, the highest you can get when you come to Mount Etna. What we're looking at is the southeast crater, the baby, it's the newest, 1971, but it's also considered the most dangerous of all because in this moment it's becoming, how to say, hyperactive. The recent catastrophic eruption on New Zealand's White Island which killed 20 and injured a further 27, has highlighted the risks of visiting active volcanoes. But in coming here, I have been told by many people that this volcano is perfectly safe. Etna certainly has one of the most sophisticated monitoring surveillance systems on Earth. You have instruments that record any sort of ground vibration. Then we measure gas emission and then magnetism and gravity and infrasound, which are acoustic signals at very low frequencies that we cannot hear. And there obviously is a great need for monitoring of volcanic ash emissions. We have surveillance cameras, we have thermal cameras, we run computer simulations. So all this is being done virtually all the time. And I've still left out a few things. <laughs> But for the people here, Etna is much more than just data. They call her Mama, and she is a constant companion. In 1669, the lava flow in six months covered a distance of 45 miles. It covered uh, little villages such as uh, Nicolosi. If you look around, you'll see old flows 
late 1800s, you'll see the lava flow of 1983, and you can get into people's experience. Sono Alfio Garrone, il conditolare di questo locale che abbiamo rifatto dopo l'eruzione del 1983 e l'abbiamo riaperto nel 1985 e oggi ci troviamo di nuovo a lavorare per il turismo che viene sull'Eni. E come si può vedere in questa immagine, vediamo in alto questo fiume di lava che scende, arriva sopra il nostro locale, la prima struttura ad essere colpita dalla lava. Abbiamo ricominciato, come si vede qua, a fare la nuova costruzione sopra la lava ancora calda. There is no universal system to tell you the chances of an eruption. Each place has its own. And fortunately, in Etna's case, the lava moves very slowly. Etna has killed no more than 77 people in the last 2,700 years. So here's the thing. Intense local monitoring and strong regulation can protect people. But by visiting, you put your trust in others and individual tour operators. What you can do is research what's happening at your volcano to help you understand the risks. That's Simon Platz at Mount Etna on Sicily. Still to come. Are's nerves of steel in Zimbabwe. That's the female. That's the female standing up. She's massive. Yeah. And how to get yourself up a mast in a hurry. It's amazing. It's like you're a bird. You can see everything. So don't go away. Welcome back to the beautiful little town of Kash on the south coast of Turkey. But actually, we're going to Zimbabwe next, all the way back to 2015 when Adi was there in search for lions. He ended up meeting up with a breeding program that returns the lions to the wild in hopes of restoring their numbers. And he ended up getting really, really close. Now I've come to the Lion Encounter Programme, which is right next to Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, because they say they're doing important work here, trying to rebuild the lion population in Africa. Lions in the wild uh, are actually in quite a, a dire circumstance. Their, their, their populations are decreasing at, at a rapid rate. Uh, I'll give you figures from 1970, 250,000 lions uh, figures from 2002, 28,000. So we're looking at a huge population decrease in 32 years, half a human lifespan. It's, it's a, a massive decrease. The project is split between two countries, Zimbabwe and Zambia. Here in Zimbabwe, lion cubs that have been born in captivity are taken in and cared for and then released into vast fenced off game reserves, either here or over the border in Zambia where they form a pride and learn to fend for themselves. Once these lions breed, the plan is to transfer their cubs out into the wild. But getting those lions born in captivity used to the bush is the first step on a long journey. What one would experience at Lion Encounter in Victoria Falls is all part of what we call stage one, okay? It's where lions are Captive lions are introduced into their natural environment. That's the whole reason for the walk. So we take them out three times, four times a day, regardless of, uh, of whether there's paying visitors getting involved or, or anything like that. They, the whole aim is to get them out into their natural environment. Uh, and they experience, they learn stuff. Although interaction with humans is kept to a minimum, the project does give you a chance to get close to the lions while they're still relatively young. These ones are just 12 months old. Are we okay with them being that close? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Is that, that's the female? That's the female standing up. She's massive. She's more like investigating on us. She has, uh, if you check, she has been constantly looking at you because now she might be interested in this wheelchair, which is a very good sign to us that whatever surrounds them, they're always investigating. You can even see that uh, with a boy, his mane is developing now. Yeah. Hey, Cubs, how are you? 
Zulu and Pendu are brother and sister, and they've formed a special bond with their keeper Musa. But it's a bond that eventually will have to be broken if these lions are to learn to fend for themselves. They're so comfortable with you. And that is just, it's just beautiful. You're the captain at the moment. At the yeah? moment, I'm the captain. Yeah. <laughs> In around eight months, it'll be too dangerous to walk with Zulu and Pendu. So I'm lucky to get a chance to do it now. The symbol that the lion is across the world. I mean, uh, uh, you ask anybody around the world, a, a 10 year old Canadian boy or a 10 year old Russian boy or Australian boy, what is a lion? They'll give you some sort of description. It just has that impact on the world. Everyone knows what it is. So to lose it in its wild existence is, is uh, it would be a massive loss. It's only when you see a lion feeding that you get an idea or you start to understand just how powerful they are. I mean, it's so impressive. And that lion is only three years old. Those are memories of Ari's trip to Southern Africa back in 2015. Now for something completely different, the busy English Channel. The Tenacious is the first tall ship in the world to be fully adapted for a disabled crew. It's run by the Jubilee Sailing Trust, which claims that its adventures can provide life-changing experiences for people with all different kinds of abilities. We sent Alex Taylor to check it out. And we catch up with him early in the morning after his first bumpy night at sea. Hello. How are you feeling? Good, thank you. I'm going back to bed now. After a stormy and pretty sleepless night at sea, it's time for breakfast with my shipmates in the mess. It's called Happy Hour, where everyone works hard, and washes, and makes everything spick and span, except I've lost my team and what I'm meant to be doing. Many years ago, we had a young lad come on Lord Nelson and he had multiple cirrhosis and he didn't get out of the car. He was helped out of the car by his mother and father, popped in a wheelchair and we pulled him up the gangway. After two weeks on air, he walked off the ship right, with the help, with the help of the sticks, didn't want his chair and his mother and father couldn't believe it. And that's why we run. That's, what, that's why we do what we do. On the final day, the beautiful weather gave me the chance to do something that I've been looking forward to, but also secretly threading. Climbing the ship's mast. Luckily, I'm not going first though. It's kind of amazing. In fact, it is mad. Go on, Neil. Oh, God. For some of the folk who don't quite get what we do to start with, this is the point where generally they all get it. Oh my God, you're amazing. You're so good. How do you feel? How do you feel? Great. Great. No. You're amazing. Right, you're definitely going to be the best at this, Alex, because you've seen it like Am four I? times now. Well, I'm glad yeah. you have confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm dancing here. Da -da 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 -da. Lowering back down and under. He's not dancing back. I don't think he's interested. Oh, I've watched it all morning. I'm excited now. Oh, yeah. I want to get Fine it done. Enough. I'll say that now, though. I mean, once I'm halfway up, I might change my mind. I'm going to rest that there. This is the handle. You're going to have the grip towards you. Yeah. Okay. And basically, it slides up the rope. Yeah. But when you pull down, it grips and it will pull. Three, six. Hey. Two, three, four, five, six. Hang on, 
I'm stuck. I'm not really. Yet. There you go. I can't really explain it. Yeah, like it's hard work out there, but if you're up there, my god, it's amazing. It's like you're a bird. You can see everything. It's weightlessness as well, so you're just free. And I've never had that ever. And it's really, really high. Just to make that point clear, it's very high up. But it's very nice. I didn't want to come down, but it was beautiful. You want to do it again? I'll go again now, yeah, guys? Yeah, is that right, yeah? After almost a week at sea, finally landed inside our destination, Pool Harbour. I can see land. I miss land quite a bit. Overall, though, it's actually been amazing. It's been hard, as I keep saying, but it's been worth it. As a person who's in a chair, especially in my case, it's often quite hard to explore. As a kid, I kind of had to ask other people for that help, and you kind of have to imagine things and that's why I would write books and things or read books and have ideas. I couldn't really do it, so I had to write it. But then here it's quite nice because you actually go on board, you get to do that stuff and go on the seas, which is lovely. I've been up Mars, which I don't do every day, so that was actually amazing really. I mean, I've never ever thought I could do that. That's Alex Taylor having occasional bursts of fun on board the Tenacious. Well, that's all for this week, but coming up next week. Addy's back, looking at another big issue in travel. This time, revealing some of the inner workings of how travel's been made affordable. And the story behind those complicated COVID-19 refunds. Remember, you can watch all of our recent episodes on the BBC iPlayer, and we're on all the regular social media platforms too, so make sure to check us out there. But for now, from me, Mike Corey, here in Cash Turkey, keep planning those next adventures, and hopefully we'll see you back on the road again very, very soon. Goodbye.